On today's episode of Locked On Canucks, we continue our search to determine which Canuck team is the greatest of all time. And today, we'll take a look at my two favorite Canuck teams of all time. It's Locked On Canucks on a special Sunday edition, and it starts now. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Sunday, June the 26th edition of Locked On Canucks. I'm, of course, your host, Justin Pooney. You can find me at Twitter at underscore process sports. Our show on Twitter at Locked On Canucks. Please also like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Of course, I want to thank you for making Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. Or in this case, your last listen of the day. It's late on Sunday evening. Um, Of course, we will get into our greatest Canuck team series of all time. Featuring the 2003 Vancouver Canucks. Taking on the 2011 Stanley Cup. Not 2003 Canucks taking on the 2011 team that should have won the Stanley Cup. But didn't Vancouver Canucks. Um, And of course, they will face on tomorrow's episode. The 1994 Stanley Cup team that showed Stanley Cup finalist Vancouver Canucks, um, who beat the 1982 Stanley Cup finalist Vancouver Canucks in our greatest Canucks series. So we will look into the 2011 team and the 2003 team in due time. But seeing as though the NHL season has come to an end, we want at Locked On Canucks to extend our congratulations to our former Northwest Division rivals, the Colorado Avalanche, on their Stanley Cup victory. Their first victory since 2001. And oh, how the times have not really changed. Because for all you Canucks fans who are, you know, in around the same age as me, I was born in 96. Uh, The year the Avs actually won their first Stanley Cup after moving from Quebec City. Um, Also, uh, I don't know if any of you saw it, but the ESPN E60 on, on, I know I'm getting off topic here, but it came up because of 96 and it fits perfectly into it. But um, that ESPN E60 today that came out of the unrivaled, uh, the rivalry, detailing the rivalry between the Detroit Red Wings and the Colorado Avalanche was absolutely stellar. Um, being the hockey fan that I am and the hockey historian that I am, I knew all about this rivalry. I, even though I wasn't, I was an infant uh, when this rivalry started. Um, being the hockey fan I am, I always knew that there was this heated rivalry between uh, Detroit and Colorado. Um, watching YouTube videos on it and seeing former players like uh, Claude Lemieux and Darren McCarty talk about it. I saw the brawl, um, you know, the Drapers, the Maltbees, uh, all those guys. Uh, amazing, amazing, amazing piece done by ESPN on that. Um, had interviews with Forsberg, Sackick, Patrick Waugh, Iserman, Shanahan. All the big names you can imagine. Stan Bowman. Uh, not Scotty Bowman, not Stan Bowman. Scotty Bowman, excuse me. It, Mark Crawford, former Canuck coach, the coach of the Avalanche when they won their first cup. Um, an absolute stellar piece. Of course, detailing the highs of the uh, Red Wings and Avs, you know, rivalry from the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, where, you know, it saw the Avs win their first cup in 96 and the Red Wings won. But the Avalanche won again in 2001. Um, again, Sackick, Forsberg, Waugh, Rob Blake, Adam Foote, Ray Bork, um, that whole squad. And then uh, this goes into um, kind of what we're talking about today. Um, during when, the, when that Canucks team was making their ascension, uh, those West Coast Express teams, who was the team that, that you know, kind of always was them, always hovering the Canucks' biggest rival? was the Colorado Avalanche. Um, we're really going to talk about it in a f- couple of minutes, but the 3 team um, was battling with Colorado neck and neck for the Northwest Division title that year. Um, so, as I my earliest memories in hockey, um, during that 2003, you know, 2004, around that age, you know, when I was, you know, seven, six, seven years old or whatever, uh, I always knew the Colorado Avalanche were an elite franchise, and they went times, and then, you know, they 
on a first overall pick in Nathan McKinnon, second overall pick in Gabriel Landis Cog, you know, picked Kale McCarr at the top of the draft, who, uh, let's face it, has now cemented himself as uh, not only the best defenseman on planet Earth and next to Connor McDavid, the best player on planet Earth, um, a generational talent from defense. Um, and Kale McCarr um, has done some special things. Won the Conn Smythe Trophy joining. We talked about the Red Wings. Nick Lidstrom and Bobby Orr as the only defenseman to win the Stanley Cup and Norris Trophy in the same year. Talked about Gabriel Landeskog, the second Swedish-born um, captain to lift the Stanley Cup. Should have been third. Henrik Sedin should have been the other one. But I'm still not over 2011, but that's who I am. Anyway, um, so congrats to the Colorado Avalanche, Joe Sackick. Uh, you did it. You did it as a player. You've now done it as an executive. You have built a championship team that um, fell on hard times the last fell on hard times the last couple of years, where uh, they fell short of expectations. Um, but you did it. You built a championship team. You made shrewd moves. Uh, whether that was the Matt Duchesne trade, you kind of you know re energize your core there. Um, the Tyson Berry deal for Naz Kadri worked out brilliantly for you guys. Um, and just, you know, depth pickups such as Josh Manson, you know, even guys like Andrew Cogliano, uh, who won his first Stanley Cup. Um, it was a, uh, they built a very good team and they didn't have the best goalie in the world, but the team in front of them, uh, guys like, you know, their defense is mobile. You know, Devon Taves, they stole him uh, from the Islanders. And him and Kale McCarr were absolutely dynamic these playoffs. Bowen Byram, former Vancouver Giant, took a huge step forward. Um, so I just want to, you know, give props where props is due. Um, the Colorado Avalanche were much deserving of capturing Lord Stanley's Cup. And they proved that they were the best team uh, in this NHL season from... Uh, start to finish, they were the class of the league, and they proved that this playoffs. Um, they only lost four games, uh, and they never trailed in one series. And uh, yes, they got some luck on the way, uh, whether that was injuries. It's communication with the injuries Tampa came out with, but um, quite frankly, they dominated. They were the better team against Tampa, uh, dominated Edmonton, better team against St. Louis, even with Bennington not in net. And they dominated Nashville. They were the best team, and they deserved to win. And uh, as much as it pains me to see this, although they're not in our division anymore, um, the Colorado Avalanche are going to be a force. And for us Canucks fans out there, uh, the cup is going to, the road to the cup and back to um, where the Canucks want to go, might have to go through Denver once again. And um, I just hope the Canucks uh, are ready for it. Uh, now we can look forward to next season where, um, 2023, we're hoping and praying another Canucks playoff run, potentially, at least the playoffs, at least, um, and just some positive news. But again, I just wanted to give thanks to the Colorado Avalanche for uh, opening up old wounds. Um, as a child, I hated the Colorado Avalanche because they were always so damn good and they always beat up on the Canucks. Now they don't really beat up on the Canucks anymore. Um, but they're really good again, and it sucks. And it reminds me of my childhood, which we'll touch on after this break, where we will go into the two teams that really shaped my childhood as a Canucks fan. But first, I want to talk to you guys about the good folks at Built. For people who are in, who the, for the people who invented healthy and tasty, comes the puffy, the comes the latest gift for your taste buds. You've probably tried the amazing coconut brownie chunk built bar, but guess what? Your friends at Built have given a coconut brownie chunk the puffs treatment. That's right, the coconut brownie chunk built bar flavor you love in delicious, chewy marshmallow covered 100% real chocolate. It's like a puff, fluffy <laughs> cloud of coconut brownie goodness. But stop drooling and listen. They are good for you. Low calorie, low sugar, high protein, and all delicious. Coconut brownie chunk puffs are the or for a limited time. Go to built.com to make sure you don't miss out. They're going because they taste amazing. All built bars made with collagen protein absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. 
eat something that tastes good and is good for you. The best part about Built Puffs is, of course, they taste the amazing, but you can enjoy them guilt-free because they are actually good for you. They're a perfect treat for when you've got a craving, you need to satisfy your sweet tooth, or you just want a quick, healthy snack. They're an excellent source of protein, as I mentioned. Delicious coconut, rich, sweet brownie, creamy marshmallow. Stop fantasizing. Get to Built.com to order your box of coconut brownie chunk Built Puffs right now. Special offer, go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and get 15% off your order. Once again, that's use promo code LOCK15. So we are back. Again, we congratulated the Colorado Avalanche, and I touched on how they, you know, really shaped my childhood. My the kind of the first team I hated uh, was the Colorado Avalanche because Joe Sakic, Milan Hayduk, Peter Forsberg, Adam Foot, Alex Tangay, uh, Patrick Waugh, and then David David Abisher, uh, they ruined my childhood because they would beat the Canucks. And um, this year that we're going to first look at 2002, 2003, that year, the Vancouver Canucks uh, was the first time that I really got uh, into it with the Colorado avalanche and Canucks rivalry, because not only was it on the, uh, excuse me, uh, but between the teams, um, but it was between their superstar players, such as Peter Forsberg and Marcus Naslin. So, as we look at this 2002-2003 team, uh, kind of the you know the culmination of years previous of the horrible West Coast Express years, uh, not the horrible West Coast Express years, the horrible Mike Keenan years, um, which saw the Canucks you know were basically the worst team in the league. You know they were finished tenth in the Western Conference. Um, you know there's losing seasons. They were last place, but you saw. The emergence of Marcus Nasland, you know, in the 2000-2001 season, uh, they finished eighth um, in the Western Conference. And, you know, they lost eventually to the Colorado Avalanche. Marcus Nasland had 41 goals that year. Then we go to the 0-1-0-2 season where Nasland had 40. They had 42 wins. And they again finished eighth in the Western Conference. That's where they played Detroit in the first round, won the first two games, and then faltered. But that next year, the 0203 season, it was kind of the crescendo, you would say, uh, for this Vancouver Canucks team, that West Coast Express era. Because, ladies and gentlemen, that team had 45 wins. And of course, they were led by head coach Mark Crawford, general manager Brian Burke, who led this team out of that dark late 90s Mike Keenan shadow and built a great team. Well, not it was actually a very good team. Uh, a great team, in my personal opinion, um, with some shrewd moves, of course, acquiring uh, Todd Bertuzzi, Ed Jovanovsky, building on a core with um, Marcus Nasland. Uh, then, they, of course, they brought in Brendan Morrison, Henrik and Daniel Sedin, Trent Klatt, Dan Kluche, of course, Merrick Malik, Matthias Oland, Brent Sopel, the whole gang. And this year, in 2000. 2003, um, we saw Marcus Naslin reach the 100 point mark, 48 goals, 56 assists for 104 points. Todd Bertuzzi had 46 goals, Brendan Morris at 25. The West Coast Express was absolutely electric, the best line in hockey. Um, the Canucks had scored 264 goals that year. Um, a definite, um, Amazing offensive outburst. Um, they actually, they finished second in the Northwest Division that year. Um, they had more wins than Colorado, which had 42. Uh, but Colorado had seven more OT losses, um, which culminated in them capturing the division with 105 points. That's where the Canucks finished fourth. Uh, and they took on the St. Louis Blues um, in that playoff. A seven-game series where um, they... Um, Eventually won in Game 7. And then they took on the Minnesota Wild, the new, uh, the newly expanded Minnesota Wild, who, of course, beat uh, the defending cup champs, the Colorado Avalanche, in the first round. Um, and it was very, very interesting because the Canucks then took a 3-1 lead 
um, in the play, excuse me, in that series against the Minnesota Wild. You know, they won the first game, lost second game. They won back to back in the XL Energy Center, three two and three two in overtime. Then they lost seven two at home uh, to Minnesota. Then five one, and then laid an egg four two in Game Seven. And of course, Minnesota went on to face the Anaheim Ducks. And then they went on to play the Ducks, excuse me, went on to beat the Wild and play the New Jersey Devils, who captured their third Stanley Cup in 10, uh, excuse me, eight years. Um, that was the year the Canucks should have made the finals. Um, they did not get it done. And that will always be remembered of this West Coast Express era team. Uh, they could not get it done in the playoffs. Um, they were surely the, one of the most talented teams in the league. They were uh, definite cup contenders, um, and they laid an egg in the playoffs. Now, again, that St. Louis series, they fell down 3-1, came back and won, um, but then they laid the egg 3-1 against the Minnesota team that they should have beat. But this was the dead puck era, um, and this offensive team, and that, that offensive team that the Canucks were, um, fell to the trap game of Jacques Lemaire, and the Minnesota Wild. And uh, it still hurts. Even though I was maybe, well, I was like seven, seven then. I still remember it. Um, and it was horrible. But as all of these teams, did, this Canucks team, what I always remember is they ignited my love for hockey, but they also brought this franchise back to relevancy. It was the West Coast Express era Canucks that started that extended long um, sellout streak at GM Place and Rogers Arena. Um, they rebuilt, you know, the trust within the organization with the fan base who, uh, quite frankly, probably lost a lot of faith due to the Mike Keenan era, you know, seeing guys uh, like Trevor Linden get shipped out. Of course, he was a part of those West Coast Express teams. It was brought back by Brian Burke um, and Mark Crawford. Um, and that team, that team right there, uh, they they instilled a lot of hope and a lot of, I certainly know people my age um, and around my group. Um, that's the team that we all say was the first team that we really fell in love with. Um, that West Coast Express, that 2 3 Canucks squad that didn't do anything in the playoffs, but definitely were teams that were offensive powerhouses. The West Coast Express, Marcus Nazem was the best goal scoring winger um, on the planet. Um, and they definitely deserve to be remembered as one of the greatest friend and one of the best teams in franchise history. Uh, they set records that were broken later on, but they were, you know, the for regular season success, the gold standard uh, for this franchise for, you know, for years. And um, they definitely deserve to be uh, on this list as the greatest Canucks team of all, one of the greatest Canucks teams of all time. Unfortunately, they didn't have the playoff success like the three we had. Uh, but they will always be remembered. Um, and coming up after this break, uh, final break, we're going to touch on the 2011 team. Um, and then I'll give you guys my pick, who is the greatest team who will face uh, the 90 in Monday's episode. But uh, stick around for that. And we are back. Welcome back to Locked On Canucks, the edition of Locked On Canucks, where we congratulate the Colorado on their third Stanley Cup win in franchise history continue uh, to determine which Canuck team is the greatest in France. Yesterday's episode, we discussed the Cinderella story Canucks against uh, the 94 team, which underachieved in the regular season, but hit their stride in the playoffs and went on a magical run to Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals against the New York Rangers. We just touched on uh, the West Coast Express uh, 02-03 uh, Vancouver Canucks, who were, you know, brought restored faith uh, to a fan base that was in the dark ages for a few years in the late nineties and early two thousands that built their way back up uh, to become a, a cup contender, Marcus Naslin, Todd Bertuzzi, Mark Crawford, Brian Burke, that whole school, but didn't never make it to the pinnacle of the NHL playoffs. Well, this team right here that we're going to talk about right now, damn near busted every rule uh, record in Canucks history. Uh, shattered 
everything, every record you could think of. Won the first Presidents Trophy in franchise history. Had the 2-0 Stanley Cup lead in the finals, only to lose in Game Seven at home. And uh, that, my folks, is the 2011 Stanley Cup finalist Vancouver Canucks team. And this team here, of course, won the President's Trophy. Um, was built by Mike Gillis. Uh, was the architect, head coach, Alain Vino, Roberto Luongo, and Net Ryan Kessler, Kevin Bieksa, your favorite hockey night in Canada analyst, Alex Burrows, and of course, Henrik and Daniel Sedin. Daniel Sedin, of course, won the Art Ross Trophy this year with 41 goals and 63 assists. Henrik Sedin had 94 points after his uh, Hart Trophy and Art Ross win the year previous. Uh, Ryan Kessler had 41 goals. Michael Samuelson had 50 points. Christian Arrow from the back end had 50 points. Alex Burrows had 26 goals. A young, a spry Alex Adler had 33 points. And this team... Um, 54 wins, not only 117 points, franchise records, first in goals for, first in goals against. Um, just the best Canucks team I've ever seen play, flat out. And I might be giving it away in my opinion, but um, this team was the definition of a build. Um, we saw at the end of the West Coast Express years, um, Dave Norris, of course, brings in Roberto Luongo um, and has, you know, pieces that were drafted previously, the Ryan Kesslers, the Alex Burrows, or the Alex Burrows wasn't drafted, but in the system, you know, the Yannick Hansons, Kevin Bx, as they all grew. Um, and as Elaine Vino rose to the ranks and Mike Gillis came on, uh, Mike Gillis did a wonderful job adding the secondary pieces around that core that kind of grew up together. Of course, Henrik and Anderson were more experienced, but the rest of that core, the Kesslers, the Burrows, the Hansons, the Bieksas, the Raymonds, all those guys grew up together um, in the minor leagues in the Man with the Manitoba Moose, and they culminated into the greatest season in Vancouver Canucks history, the 40th year that started off with Orland Curtin back giving the C to Henrik Steen, which was, of course, given up by Roberto Luongo. Um, the Canucks, of course, were coming off back-to-back uh, second-round losses to the um, Chicago Blackhawks. The Canucks were, of course, uh, those last two years, the two years previous, um, division champions um, and fully deserving of being cup contenders, but ran into the Chicago Blackhawks. And this year, of course, they ran into the Blackhawks again. Who could forget that first round series, epic first round series. Canucks go up 3-0, lose the next three games. All panic is here. Uh, we go into that game seven in April of 2011. I believe it was a Monday night. And all the pressure in the world was on the Vancouver Canucks. Had they lost that game, there would have been swift changes. Everybody would have been gone. You could have kissed that whole organization goodbye. But what happens? Alex Burrow scores the game winner in Game 7. After he had so many chances to end it, he ends it finally in overtime off that knuckle puck slap shot. Rogers Arena explodes. The whole lower mainland explodes. I'm in my house in Surrey, British Columbia. I explode. Um, I'm pretty sure that right there, uh, next to the Crosby Golden Goal and the Bieksa Stanchion Goal, those and so I would again side topic, but the five sporting events I will never ever forget in my life and where I was: Burroughs 2011, Crosby 2010, Bieksa Stanchion Goal, Richard Sherman interception against the 49ers, and Malcolm Butler. Well, and you can throw the Kawhi shot on them too, but Malcolm Butler interception in the Super Bowl. Uh, those were the six events in my life where um, I remember where I was, how I felt, um, and it plays vividly in my mind. So 2011 brought great memories for me. Um, knowing people that lived through the 94 run, that I could f attest to how they felt. Um, I will say this though. 
Um, I wasn't alive in 94, but when I saw my parents cheering uh, and relatives that I know cheering, um, I know they had more fun in 2011 because this team was special. Um, they were just dominant, and they went finally slay the Dragon. Ryan Kessler carried the team uh, in a six-game win against the National Predators. Um, they went up against the San Jose Sharks with that power play, the number one power play in the league, just flexed their muscles all over the Sharks. And then they head to the Stanley Cup Finals to face the big, bad Boston Bruins, who won a tough series against the Tampa Bay Lightning um, in seven games. And here comes Tim Thomas, Dino Charles, Patrice Bergeron, Brad Marchand, Milan Lucic, Michael Ryder, Mark Recchi, Dennis Seidenberg, all those guys. And the Canucks win game one. Rafi Torres off a great Ryan Kessler toe pick on the blue line. Feeds it to him. Scores in the last minute. The Canucks win game one. <sighs> game two goes to overtime. And Alex Burrows, as he did so many times, came up with the clutch winner. And they are up 2 nothing. And I remember where I was. I remember thinking, wow, two more wins. And they win the Stanley Cup. And they go to Boston. Aaron Rome gets suspended. Of course, Dan Hamus gets hurt as well early in that series as well. And the Canucks proceed to be uh, the latest team. Yeah, and they blow the 2 0 series lead and lay an egg in game seven where they culminated with a 4 0 loss at Rogers Arena. The city proceeded to burn. Touched on the last week, the city burned. And it still stinks. And that was, uh, how old was I then? I was 15. No, 15? 15 or 14 or 15. One, I forget how old I was. I think it was 15. And I cried. Took my Roberto Luongo jersey off, threw it. And I cried. And I cried in it. But 11 years later, looking back on it, um, it's pretty evident that that 2011 team would absolutely wax um, the 2003 team, not only from goaltending to forward to end defense that Roberto Luongo, Dan Kluche could not hold Roberto Luongo's jockstrap or Corey Schneider's to be fair. Dan Kluche uh, was never a good goalie. The Canucks won in spite of him, not because of him. So uh, Roberto Luongo wins that battle. Defense, Jovanovski, Oland, Sopel, Malik, Salo was on both teams. Um, you know, but they don't compare to it. You know, very good defense core. But Ham Hughes, Airhoff, Bieksa, young Chris Tanev, Ballard, um, I give it a wash, but I'll give the edge to the 2011 defense core. And then up front, quite frankly, other than the West Coast Express, um, you're going up against back to back 100 point guys in the Sedins. And then the Sedins in 02, 03 uh, were not at that level yet. Uh, as much as great as Marcus Nazan was, um, that West Coast Express team, I don't think could handle uh, the prime Sedins in their cycle game with Alex Burroughs. Um, and that 2011 team had some bite to it. A lot of people want to think they were soft and all of that. They had bite to it. They, you know, they had the best power play in the league. Um, and they were the best panel. That allowed the least amount of goals. Uh, that team in 2011 would win. It probably wouldn't be a four-game sweep. I'd have too much respect for the Nasla and Bertuzzi team. It'd probably, they'd probably win a game or two. Um, but that 2011 team would win. Um, and they would be... It would be pretty evident. So there you have it. It was kind of simple, but I just love the tournament, the 2002, 2003 team. One of my all time favorites. I'm trying to actually find uh, a Marcus Naslin jersey, uh, preferably signed. So if any of you out there have your hands on one or know somebody selling one, uh, leave it in the comments. Reach out to me on Twitter because uh, I'm trying to get my hands on one because I do want to put it up in my where I'm. Uh, I want to start filming more. Um, I'm just kind of getting that under construction. Um, so if anybody has one, let me know. Uh, I would love to. Um, but yeah, the 2011 uh, Vancouver Canucks, definitely uh, the 2003 Vancouver Canucks, Canucks, um, 
they are going to be pitted up against. Tomorrow, locked on Canucks. Your like I said, tomorrow we're going to talk about which team is the best of all time. The '94 team, '11 team. Finally, we re- determine which Canuck team is the best so far. Potentially, the 2023 Canucks could be the best because they could win the Stanley Cup because the season's over, and we can think like that. But tomorrow we'll conclude that. Um, and we will have more about what's going on in Canuck land. Um, but I want to make push you to your second listen of the day, Locked on NHL, which covers the playoffs like no other. Here's the latest news and opinions from all the latest experts Monday through Friday. It is free and available wherever you get your podcast services. Take care, guys. Stay safe. And I will talk to you tomorrow.